Hey everybody, great to be here. Um, I've got uh, a pal from the last couple of years here, Melody Hobson, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Melody is president of Ariel Investments where she is in charge of firm-wide management, strategic planning, and operations, and they have about $13 billion under management. Um, pretty impressive that she was named to Time Magazine's annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. She's the vice chair of the board of Starbucks Corporation and the director of JP Morgan Chase and other places as well, uh, formerly DreamWorks board. Uh, gave one of the best TED Talks I've ever seen called Colorblind or Color Brave, which we'll talk about today. And something else we'll talk about is she is the co-chair of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art with her husband, George Lucas, which will be opening in LA in a couple of years. So welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so I'm much excited for to be here. So we've known each other for a couple of years. I still think we're getting into the know you phase, but you know, you're, you're in a very um, you know, decisive, smart person. You're opinionated. Uh, and I always wondered what your, um, your influences were. Who were the biggest influences in your life, not only personally, but professionally? Well, I think that's a really great question. It's a very, very, very long list. Yes. Very long. Um, I think there are the obvious people. So in my situation, I'm the youngest of six kids. And I was um, raised by a single mom in Chicago. And in my family, I'm very, very young. So my sisters are more than two decades older than me. And so when I grew up, they used to tell me that I was found on the doorstep. That's nice. And that I wasn't their sibling. I really am. Uh, but so certainly growing up in that environment was something that influenced me in a major, major way, especially being the last child. Um, I think that was a gift that I received because I got to see all of these people in front of me and the choices that they made and have a decision tree of do you want to do that or not. And I think that was a real wonderful, wonderful thing. So I do believe in a lot of ways I'm a composite of all of them. My mother had very clear values, very clear, very shy and soft-spoken, but firm in her beliefs. And I think that that really did influence my um, ethical center and how I view the world and see the world and my belief in truth and justice. And so I think that was very important. And then the other influencers, I say, I always tell people, I'll give you two other buckets. I was mentored by people I never knew. So I tell people I was mentored by King and Gandhi and Mother Teresa. Like I feel like they mentored me because I read all of the things that they wrote about. And I think I had the opportunity to learn from them and their words obviously all um, being very, very eloquent in how they write. But at the same time, I feel like um, the other real life mentoring I got was in boardrooms, actually. And I had the opportunity to interface with some of the most remarkable leaders, yep. certainly in America, and that really did influence my business point of view. And was that from the point of view of what you heard in the boardroom, or it also left the boardroom in terms of relationships? Both. So some of my closest relationships came out of the board boardroom, but also I saw how people thought and I saw how they pushed, and it gave me just a lot of um, food for thought about what did I want to stand for and be. And I'm talking about iconic leaders. I mean, I was in the DreamWorks boardroom with David Geffen and Paul Allen and Tom Preston and Meg Whitman. I mean, it was literally like, I called it Moguls R Us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but literally, I was like, I was the pipsqueak in the room. Nathan Merville went to college when he was 16. Sure. I mean, you couldn't even, begin to fathom the kind of brain power the, those, and that experience crew would hurt, that was in that They room. would hurt the bell curve for sure. <laughs> exactly. So let, let's stick with that. On, like, it, I've sat on boards. I've been the pipsqueak. Um, in some of them, like MGM, I was very insecure. Pandora, a little more secure. Um, what is the template for what a board member's responsibility is? I've been sort of surprised in some cases um, in the lack of strategy in some corporations, lots of budgets, but not. But like, how do you see the template of what a board member is responsible for? So first of all, let's just be super simple yep. with that definition. So you're a steward of the shareholders and your job is to um, be a fiduciary for those people who are not in the room. I remember Howard Schultz once telling me that when he sat in the room, he had two empty chairs in his mind. And one was an investor in our company and one was a partner that worked inside of the company. And I always thought that was a really excellent visual to hold at the same time. Sure. Would these both sets of people be proud of you and the, and the actions that you made? Because the, obviously the, the people who work there are extraordinarily important to the future and you're actually representing those people who are not in the room who own those shares of that company. So to me, first and foremost, understanding your fiduciary duty is very, very, very important. I think the other thing is to make sure that you understand 
literally the business model and what is the company trying to achieve. And if you can't get that very simply, then you've got to be dogged about getting explanations that make sense. You know, Warren Buffett says that you should be able to explain an investment idea to a six-year-old. And I actually believe that. You should be able to distill a concept very, very simply. And when I'm in rooms and people are speaking in ways that I don't understand, I will say, in my mind, what I'm saying is I know I'm smart. I've read this and reread this, or I've heard this now, and I do not understand what you're saying. So now it's you and not me. And so break it down for me again. Break it down for me again, because there's something here that I'm missing. So that role is to make sure you recognize that you're representing the shareholders, and you're thinking of the long-term um, viability, possibility, profitability, all of reputation of that business. Sure. And I think that has to stay um, top of mind. I think the strategy is one piece of that. What is the vision yep. for the company and how is that vision being executed? And do you have the people that you need to execute that vision very, very well? And of course, is the product that you're offering or the service that you're offering doing the job that it, it promises? Without mentioning names, unless you want to, um, wait, have you ever seen in a board where, where getting involved in the strategy means that you're diving too deep that the, the chief executive officer doesn't want that, they just want me to more to respond to what they're presenting? I think boards have cultures, and I think it's very understand, important to understand the culture and understand if you fit in that culture or not. So all boards are like, you know, they're, they're, there's a chemistry to a board. And there's something, the one person can throw the chemistry off, one person can seal the chemistry. And it's not about a resume, it's not about job experience, it's about the, some of the sp spoken and unspoken things that happen in a room. I think that there is a role where, in my mind, there's a, la a line where it's management's responsibility. I think there can be, I've been in rooms with people who will delve into the nth degree on a question, and what I always worry about is management then starts to think that, is, that you're solving the problem sure. and they are less engaged in the actual decision making or outcome. And I think that's a very, very bad thing. You see that a lot with the selection of, of executives where sometimes there's someone in a room who's second guessing. And I'm always like, that's management's responsibility. Sure. We just hold management accountable. We don't tell them how to do it. And I think the questions that should be asked are not um, to not dive into the details in a way that, that you are disrupting the process. And I, you only know it when you see it. It's not about is it the fifth question or is it the tenth. It's about what is your intent with this question. Sure. And there are people, sometimes their intent is to suggest they're smarter or they maybe have a better path or you know, this, that, or the other. When you start to get in that mode, then you either you probably have the wrong leader. Sure. You know, at Ariel, we always say there are activist investors, and we think people do a great job at that. That's not what we do. But if we have started doubting your leadership, we should not own this company. Yeah. We should not try to convince you how to run it. We should be out and on to the next thing. And so that's just the way that I think about it when it comes to that role in the boardroom. If you're doubting the leadership, and I, I can see it. I can say that I've not actually been in a board that I've been on where that has occurred, thank goodness. But I have been in situations where Ariel has been an investor and we've had doubts about leadership. And I think that one of the things about that is then to be very, very clear about what you're going to do in that situation. Beyond being a name and, and, uh, and obviously being successful, do you think that board members are cast these days? Um, you know, uh, uh, to our friend Jeffrey Katzenberg, he looks at boards often as a movie cast. Um, is that a helpful thing? You need the person in finance or sales or someone who's had experience in commerce. Is that an important part? Well, I laugh only because when the DreamWorks board was put together, I remember Nathan Mer Mer Merveld and I used to ride to our meetings together every um, day from the Peninsula Hotel to the Glendale com campus, so we'd be in the car together for a long time. And I remember one day Nathan was like, you know, Jeffrey cast our board very early on. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he says, well, I'm like the geeky tech guy. And I said, okay, well, what is, so I like name each sure. person. I was like, what like is the this seven person? Dwarves, so to speak. What is that person? And I won't say what names he gave sure. everyone. Unless you so, want to. No. Right. So I said, I said, well, what am I? And he says, you're the ingenue. <laughs> and I was like, hmm. And it was just like one of these moments where I thought about it. And I said, well, we do play roles in that room. Um, 
And I do think there's some casting. It's interesting, however, I think people have ideas about how a board should look. They get very caught up on criteria and resumes as opposed to leadership and yeah. good judgment. And I think they miss some really good opportunities. I've honestly, I've challenged some of, at times, tech companies for their lack of diversity. And they say, well, we're looking for engineers or this, that, and the other. And I always give the example, it's like, listen, when I went on the Starbucks board, I didn't know how to make coffee. You know, <laughs> I'm like maybe like put it in the machine and that's yep. it, but not like from, from planting it in the ground to deliver it into your door. That was not the expertise that I brought I've to always, that conversation. I've always found that in some cases, the naivete on a subject is actually an advantage. Can be, yeah. depending on, I mean, there's sometimes, you know, there, well, you know, there's that saying, there's no stupid question. And then we've all sat there when there's a stupid question. Sure. And you're like. Usually emanates with me, but yes. <laughs> Um, so well, I want to I want to get more into the board stuff. So we've seen a lot of amazing stuff happen. Um, more scandal uh, on boards in America, whether it be Uber, um, obviously the data ethics with Facebook, um, uh, CBS, um, and sexual harassment. And yet you you ask the question, where was the board? Um, were they being feckless? Were they asleep at the wheel? Um, what do you think? You know, why why is it a reaction often rather than getting in front of uh, these problems? It, it couldn't have been new to the board that there were issues at Uber, Facebook, and CBS. Where do you think the responsibility lies, and what could they have done differently? Okay, so I think that those are all unique situations for different reasons. We were an older owner of CBS. We owned the stock for a long time. And I can tell you as investors, we did not have a window. I, full disclosure, obviously, I've... Sure. Um, uh, contribute to the CBS morning show. Sure. I mean, I wasn't there every day, but I just did not have that intelligence. And maybe I was, quote, in the family. Yep. And so you would say, well, you're just an idiot then. Um, I just did not understand that. What I would say, however, is I think that boards are only as good as the questions that they ask and the management teams that they have. And if you put faith in individuals and you, there's a certain level of trust that you have to have unless there are signs indicating something differently. I think some of this, it's very, very hard to know. And that is not letting anyone off the hook. But I do think the question does become, just because business is by its nature, there are surprises. That's just, that's just what happens. And so the question that I always ask is, boards matter in times of trouble. That is full stop, the most important time that they will ever exist and when something going, is going wrong. And there, you could, it's not when, if something will go wrong, there will be a point, it's just when. Yep. When in the life of the company will you face one of those existential moments? And that's when the board really matters. So the question becomes, once these things are discovered, what do you do? Yeah. How do you handle them? And I think that, those are the bigger questions for boards. Because you aren't there. You might go four, five, six times a year. You go in for a couple days and you leave. You aren't there day in or day and day out. Maybe no one from since inside the company ever wrote you a letter expressing some concerns. Sure. Maybe the management team is really polished and together when they present to you and you just don't see it. Should you as a board member have a relationship with people underneath the CEO so that you're instead of your only information coming from the chief executive? This is the way I would ask the question. Should you have a CEO who's comfortable with you having a relationship? But much better ask. And yeah. that is telling. So it's not do you have that relationship, it's the CEO that's not comfortable with those relationships that is something that you say to yourself, antenna up, what's the issue here? Now, I've always been in situations where CEOs have often welcomed. They say, will you mentor this person? Will you spend time with this person? We want you to have breakfast with this person that we've identified. We want them to have exposure to you for whatever reason, or members of the board, or we're inviting them into dinners and we're strategically sitting them next to you. They, they want you to see the next generation or what kind of talent they yep. have or help assess it or et cetera. I think that's... The question, if someone made an inbound call to me, and I can tell you I've gotten a lot of inbound calls in my career on boards, and if I had made that known to an executive and they said they had a problem with it, that would be, you know, troubling. Yeah, got it. So uh, a problem inevitably happens. One of my favorite companies in the world, Starbucks, we were just talking, I think that the invention of ordering it on your phone and picking it up and walking right out without waiting online is the greatest invention of our century. Mobile order and pay. Um, mobile order and pay, fantastic. I know all of you are addicted. 
Um, Starbucks had an issue um, in 2018 in Philadelphia. Two black men were in uh, Starbucks. They were just waiting for a colleague. They were arrested for no reason, essentially. Um, how, did the board, how, how did the board react in that case? Did they call you immediately? Was it something that you're calling the chief executive for? Were you involved in the, in the, in the solutions for that? Yes. So all of the above. Um, I was very involved. I was in, I was in my office in San Francisco. It was a Saturday when the conversation started to go back and forth. And I was on the phone with the CEO, uh, Kevin Johnson. And I spoke to Howard that day, who was no longer CEO, but was chair. And um, I had conversations with Roz Brewer, the president. And there was a, and Vivek Varma, who was in charge of all comms. And there was a conversation about what would we do and how would we respond, et cetera. And then through that weekend, there was back and forth on reviewing what they were going to put out. How did I feel about it? What important phone calls should we make to um, you know, let people know that we were working on this? And then there was a call um, from Howard where he said, I was landing in New York on a Sunday night that same weekend. So Saturday was in my office in San Francisco. Sunday, I'm landing in New York. And it's literally like 10 o'clock at night. And he said, Melody, I think we should close the stores. What do you think? And I remember saying, I, like, I was so taken aback. And I was like, wait a minute. I said, well, How? What was the message on that? Why, why close the stores? That's what I said. Got it. All right. I cool. said, I'm learning right on stage. That was what my question was. I said, I said why? And he said, um, I think this is a really serious issue. I think we need to be extraordinarily thoughtful and deliberate about it. I think we need to tell our partners what we stand for and we need time to tell them. And the only way we can do them is to pull them all together and to close the stores. We'd only done that once before ever. He's like, this is at that level. And so I said, Howard, I literally, I wanna sleep on this. Like, I'm not gonna give you some knee-jerk reaction. I wanna mull this over in my brain overnight and I'll call you back in the morning. So I called him back, I knew how it was a 4 a.m. riser, I called him back super early and I said, Howard, just one more question, like, do you think we need this? And he said, yes. I said, let's close the stores. It was not my decision. Sure. I was just one person weighing in, but the intent was the right intent. And that is what drove me, not what is it gonna cost the company, how is it gonna affect our quarter, all of those things. At that point, brand and reputation were the most important thing. And if this went the wrong way, it could be disastrous. And again, I'm sitting there as a shareholder, I'm also sitting there thinking about those partners, and I'm sitting there as a woman of color. Yeah. And all three of those, I'm trying to manage in my own mind, including what if it were my nephew who had, sat, who had been arrested. How would I be feeling right now? How upset would I be, et cetera? And what I really, really loved about the company and where I think the true essence and humanity of our company came through is that we didn't pretend it wasn't a bad situation. We didn't try to poo-poo it. We didn't try to say this is not a big deal. We said this is serious and it goes against everything we believe in and stand for and we own it. We didn't throw the manager under the bus and try to make it about one person. Mm -hmm. We tried to make it about this is a teachable moment for our entire company and we're gonna take up the mantle and make sure that we all know what this company stands for and that's where I was most proud. Not because again, you can't control we 300 plus thousand in, uh, partners. You can't control all of those people, but in that moment, what does the company stand for? I thought it was a teachable moment for the country and the world, frankly, with what was going on in the political environment, with the race environment in, in the United States, to say that this is that serious. And we saw lots of other situations happen where they did not respond that way. Well, it's interesting. I mean, that's maybe also why diverse boards really matter. I was in the room, Roz Brewer, who's the former CEO of Sam's Club, who's a board member and, pres and chief operating officer of Starbucks. They, we had Clara Shi in the room, uh, Chinese American. We had Javier Truel, Mexican. I mean, we had a room of very, very diverse voices. It is literally one of the most diverse boards anywhere. Satya Nadella from Microsoft Indian. I mean, we can go through the list. This is just like, yeah. I'm not naming all the board members because all of them are not front of mind, but I'm giving you the diverse board members. That's the point, that you have these people with these unique experiences who could come in and say, 
guys, this is serious. Absolutely. Like, this is a big deal. I'm now going to be the woman of color in the room, on the wall for people of color, partners, customers, etc. Not that I had to hold that role, serve that role, but because everyone was compassionate and considerate of the issue, but at least I had a lens that was very, very specific. Yep. And that lens could add to the conversation. Absolutely. So we have in the audience today founders, LPs, board members, venture capitalists, and sadly these groups are not diverse. Um, uh, as it relates to race and as it relates to gender as well. I think Susan Lyon was telling me that um, the number of uh, VCs that are female are under 3% and the number of investments I think are under 10%. So there's massive um, under-representation. Um, my mentor is Tom Freston who ran Viacom I and was a Tom. colleague love, of yours. Love. And he once said to me when he promoted me, he said, the audience is beyond our own shores and all over the world and our product and executives must reflect that and it's just good business. You gave a TED talk called uh, Colorblind or Color Brave where you said, we cannot afford not to talk about race and be comfortable doing so. It's the smart thing to do. All of the business would be better with more diversity. Um, can a firm or company win in the future without that being a core value to what they're doing? No. It's suicide. It's corporate suicide. And I can tell you, um, the number of people who need the business case explained to them, I was like, you're losing the point. You have, you've already lost this argument. This is, I mean, I say this with respect, this room is an example. Yeah. I live in the world of the investment world where I'm a unicorn just by virtue of you know, being a black woman. And I can tell you that through my eyes and what I go out and see every single day is a lot of corporate suicide where it's like you don't even understand the world has changed so dramatically and if you keep living in, with this view it's just going to be very dangerous. And you have to understand, you know, I said to, I love this line that I heard from someone the other day that talked about the fact that diversity trumps intellect. And I actually believe that by bringing different points of view, we, we all in my firm read this book called The Difference by Scott Page, who sure. wrote the first mathematical formula on diversity, professor at the University of Michigan. And he talks about the fact that if you're trying to solve a really hard problem, and it has to be hard, that you want diverse to points, points of view, even diverse intellect. And in my talk, I give the example of he gives the smallpox epidemic. And he said, they brought the greatest scientific minds in the world to Europe to solve for this. And the person who led them to the solution was a dairy farmer who noticed that the milkmaids were not getting smallpox. <laughs> and it's a bovine-based vaccine because of the observation of a dairy farmer. Now, maybe he was Mensa. We will never know. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> he at least had a point of view that was very different, that you had the, the most brilliant scientific minds, probably who were largely trained the same way, they couldn't see what he could see. I think about that all the time. I think about that at Ariel, we're value investors. You know, they say value investors catch falling knives. You are trying to see what other people don't see, and the only way you can do that, you're trying to avoid group thing. The only way you can do that is you have to sit there and challenge each other from lots of different perspectives and lots of different points of view. And I remember we went to visit once, I remember we once visited the company, um, and I remember the company made a woman's product and there was not one person in the room that was a woman. And I was like, this is crazy. We used to own a company called Long's Drug Stores and they used to write their quarterly letter, their annual letter that would say, Dear Mrs. Customer. And when Mrs. Long's passed away, there were no women on the board. And we were like, this doesn't make any sense. You actually address your letter to Dear Mrs. Customer because you know that the vast majority of your shoppers are women. This is illogical. Sure. And so how do you have these insights and this perspective in this boardroom around this issue? And so again, it's not about you know, some technical expertise, which is great, financial expertise, which is great. It's about judgment and perspective that I think ultimately is gonna drive success for a lot of 21st century companies. I don't think you have to even lose those other trade-offs. I think you can have all of that and sure. this. And I, I, don't, I don't think people understand what is at stake. 
I mean, it is literally the success or failure of their business long term. When Tom said this to me, we were growing the digital division at Viacom, and it was higher, 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 grow, grow, grow. And diversity was a main part of the strategy. And yet, as I mentioned to you the other day via email, I failed terribly at that because I hired headhunters. I went to HR and I said, we, we have to get diverse hires. We have to bring them in here. And as um, times went on and I wasn't seeing candidates, not candidates of value, not seeing a lot of the candidates, um, I basically gave in to the fact that we needed to grow and we needed to hire quickly. And I blamed it on people that I assigned the job to. And it was my failure. Um, I hear that a lot in the venture capital world. I hear that a lot in tech businesses, that you're not seeing non-whites or, or, or non-Asians in, in technical jobs. So they say it's the chicken before the egg. You know, the system has to change. These are all excuses we hear. And when I hear an excuse a lot, I realize that it's probably bullshit. So how do, how do we correct ourselves? You know, what about the chicken and the egg thing? What about the not everybody has to go to Princeton or MIT or Harvard uh, job sourcing? Okay, let's start off with the fact that there are diverse people at Princeton and Harvard yes. and, and the like. I've used that example actually in Silicon Valley. I was like, if you just looked at the math of the number of women and minorities who graduate from Stanford, more of them would work for you. Like if you just did that, so something's wrong with the system if you're not even getting some proportionate number that graduate from the school. So let's just, you know, that's one piece of it. Sure. One of my favorite sayings of all time, math has no opinion. It just doesn't, it just is. So especially for all these intellectual minds, I'm like, let's just go to the very, very basic math. But then let's go to the excuses and decide. This, one of the things that I've been challenging people with is, the business world is the only world where the one thing they will say we are working on is diversity. Everything else, you fail, you get fired. Everything else. You don't make earnings, the CEO doesn't have the job. The product doesn't come out in time, the person doesn't have the, the job. The, the match manufacturing schedule gets off, you lose part of your bonus. Like everything else, we're kind of ruthless about, yeah. really. But around diversity, it's like, we're working on it. Sure. We're trying. We're really like, we just, you know, we got the right intent. And I'm like, listen, as Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> there is no try. There's nothing else we try on, nothing. So those that were failing at that time, like me, how do I course correct? So I was gonna say, first and foremost, it's personal. I mean, I ask people, look at your life and your day. Who do you spend your time with? Force yourself to go outside of your comfort zone and invite people in your life who don't look like you, who don't think like you, who don't come from where you come from. Make a concerted decision once a week, once a month, whatever you want it to be, I am going to actually force myself to have different people around me and different points of view. That's one. I think it it's, it's changes your perspective on the world. Second, you get what you incent. What are your incentives? Our incentives on everything up, sales, marketing, production schedules, et cetera, they're very clear. You can't hit targets where you don't have a goal. Yep. So you need a goal. So and be when ruthless you start, about that. Right, we have goals on everything else, schedules, profits. We have goals on everything, eyeballs. I mean, we can go through all the things we have goals around. You need a KPI on diversity. Correct, yeah. and then you have to decide you're gonna hold everyone accountable. So we say to people, it's like, if the person is a world beater at something and they don't have a diverse team, do they get their whole bonus if diversity is important to you? The number of people is like, well, I don't wanna penalize and this, that, and the other. And I was like, but if it's really important to you, should they earn the whole amount? Yep. Very few people will put their money, their, their money where their mouth is on this issue. True. But we will put our money where their mouth is on everything else. Let me, let me ask you, uh, when you're on the board of DreamWorks, you know, one oh, of the- Oh, and you need a d diverse yeah. slate. Oh, got it. So you gotta force it. You know, the thing is, I always, so people always say to me, it's like, well, I can't find anyone for that job. And I was like, there are 300 million Americans. <laughs> there is someone in this country who is diverse, who can do the job? Yep. And, and you are just not yeah. looking in we the just, right place. We places. just did not try hard enough. No. Absolutely. So I wanna, I wanna ask you if this happened. So you sat on the board of DreamWorks. We're both friends with Jeffrey. We know that he wants to be successful and be successful um, in the right way. Um, I was sitting with a head of a television company the other day and I said, you know, with all that's gone on in this country with race, 
um, I realized how much of what I think about the world is shaped by television and, and film, the narrative, not even news. And I said, would you ever look at your casts in a movie or in a television and say, what are they from a diversity standpoint, but also what are the narratives that you're telling about non-whites? And they said it would be suicide. You can't tell the creative community what to write about. And yet, I think that unintended consequences of that are how we think about people that don't look like us. Did you ever take Jeffrey out to the shed or, or talk to him about the, and again, it was animated, but still diversity in animated films? So I'm gonna answer your question, but I'm gonna give you the answer that I love so much from Shonda Rhimes, who I have a girl crush on, and I tell her that all the time. I think she's just magnificent. Scandal in every, in every hit show on television. But she said to me once, she said, it's, you know, I'm annoyed by this concept of diversity. I just call it normal. She's like, because when you walk it into the world, that's what the real world looks like. And our settings are not normal. So she says, I don't call it diversity. If you walk down the street in New York City, Chicago, a whole lot of places here in LA, yep. you are gonna see every walk of life, every kind of person, every kind of form or fashion. And she's like, but for whatever reason, we've made that an exception when that's actually the rule yep. in this country. So that's first and foremost. Jeffrey, we have this very funny story about I'm on the board and we're watching, we always watch the movies and um, we watch Megaminds the whole board. So the movie finishes and we're sitting um, and Jeffrey says, you know, what do you think? And the movies would always be mostly done when we were watching them. It's very, sometimes we watch early stage, but we get the pitch early on what the slate was, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm new on the board. I got moguls are us around me. Like I'm the pipsqueak. And then I'm like, I just raised my hand and I'm like, there were, what city was this in? And he says, well, it's not a real city, it's a fictional city, think of it as Gotham. And I was like, okay. I said, well, <laughs> he asked, he asked Melody and I was like, Gotham had no black people, none. I said, there was one baby, but it didn't even have a black parent. I said, I didn't see any people of color in the entire movie, and the only person of color was the, the protagonist who was blue and from another planet. And so, the, you know, a couple of people kind of chime in, we end the meeting, I go back to Chicago and I get this call, and he's like, I need you to come back to LA. I was like, come back to LA? He's like, I need you to come back to LA. So I get on a plane and go back to LA, and I'm like, oh God, oh God, you know, I'm thinking, so we sit down at the grill, and he says to me, you know, you really embarrassed me in that meeting. So I am ready to go. I'm like leaned in, my fists are kind of clenching underneath the table, and I'm like, wow, I'm gonna have like a fight with Jeffrey Katzenberg in public. In my mind, like a bubble thought is That's like, success. I was like, you're getting kicked off the board, and you're gonna like really go at it. And he's like, it's never going to happen again. We didn't see it. He said, I'm beyond embarrassed. I'm so upset. I can't believe we did that. We didn't see it. He said, I went back and watched the whole movie and I watched the movies from your eyes. And he said, I didn't see it. And then afterwards, things changed. You know, we used to have these, we, we did um, uh, Rise of the Guardians with a black director. We did um, Home with Rihanna as a mixed race um, person. J-Lo was her mother. She was black and Hispanic. We got so many letters from people saying, there's never been a character with curly hair like my child. And I kept saying to Jeffrey, blacks and Hispanic, African-Americans and Hispanic, we over-index in movie going. Sure. Like this is a layup. There was so much that happened. It wasn't purposeful. It was just thinking more inclusively about what the opportunity set was. It wasn't me telling anything. So then we'd be in our, I become chair of DreamWorks. We're in our board meetings. And I remember once we had hired a girl, whole group of people for a new division. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, where are the black and Hispanic people? And they like gave me all these reasons why. And so I was like, wait a minute, we just like hired a whole new division and like we couldn't find any diversity. And I said, and I'm sitting in this chair? No. No, Jeffrey, to his credit, he was like apoplectic. He was not, this was not one of these things that was okay no. with him. And it was someone who was in charge who had done it. 
So interestingly, after that meeting, there would be, we'd be sitting in a meeting and he would say something like, hey, to the head of HR, Dan Satterwhite, has Melody met the new X, Y, or Z? And he was like, no. He's like, maybe you should bring that person in for Melody to meet. So the person would come in and I would look at the person that they would say, you know, we want you to meet them. The smile would turn up on the side of my face. Jeffrey would smile, Dan Satterwhite would smile the person. And I'd look at the person and I'd say, you know what? They know I'm really happy because you're black. Or they know I'm really happy because you're Hispanic. Or they know I'm really happy because, and I said, and the person with literally one of the women said once, she was like, well, I'm glad I'm black too then. <laughs> so, but it was one of those things where they like, they knew that I was watching. Yeah. And they were very, they didn't hire someone just because, yeah. but they had more of a lens of, yeah. how is Melody seeing this from the chair that she sits at? I love the story because it's an executive that wasn't insecure about it and, no. and dealt with it and a board member that delivered value. Um, I want to end on one last question. That's why we ended up with a great working relationship. He was always open. Yeah, I love that. And, and uh, I want to geek out on one last question. I know we're a little over time. It's around the media space. Um, your husband is, as you know, one of my heroes, George Lucas, and uh, I geek out on that when we have lunch. Right. Um, and you're one of the biggest shareholders of Disney. You served on the board of DreamWorks, as we discussed. Um, content and media are going through major disruption. You know, you have other players like Netflix, Hulu coming in, studios um, are, you know, trying to figure out what the direct-to-consumer model. Where do you see the future of uh, media? What, what do we have to look out for as an investor, but also as, um, you know, a partner to one of the greats? Okay. This is a lot, so I'm gonna to try to be really brief. Yep. I'm gonna tell you, we've owned a lot of media at Ariel, a lot over the years, CBS, Viacom, um, MSG. I mean, I could just go through Gannett. I could go through a long, long list of long-standing media holdings. Um, what I would say that we bought just beautifully over the years and made a lot of money from. But what I would say is this, I think I would put it in a couple of buckets and I'll give you George's point of view as well as well as our investment team. So first, we start with whatever, what was old is new again, which is it's always gonna be about content. And the content is king and it's the most important thing and that has not changed and will not change. However, there are a couple of nuances that I think are important. So George would say to you, it's going to be more and more over the top it's gonna be portable, it's like Burger King, have it your way. He's like, it's gonna be when you want it, where you want it, how you want it. That is inarguable, there's no question about it. He says it's gonna be democratized by the fact that you, it's gonna be cheaper to do unbelievably great things. Things that you could never have done before in movies, you're gonna be able to do at lower and lower costs, which means more and more people are going to do it. Because of that, there's going to be, which we agree with, a lot more content. The issue is, and I, George and I were just talking about this on the phone, 10% will be great, just like now, and 90% will be really bad. There will just be a lot more. So this was his nuance on it. He said, the one thing that you have to think about now is, there will be a business of curating. Now that's what Netflix is. Yep. So the business of curating will be, and I'll tell you the magic bullet that they have, but the, the, which you know already, the business of curating, he's like, there's gonna be a business. There are gonna be people who are gonna help you figure out what you're supposed to watch. God, because I there's hope gonna so. be so much. And he said, people are not going to wanna waste their time watching garbage, yep. unless garbage becomes popular. Sure. So <laughs> he also said, you're gonna need that curator, especially around news because you won't know what's true. And so because of that, he says, I see this business around just the curation. The brand is gonna be really important. You're gonna to need to know what a company stands for. And he said, here's the simple example. Why do you like Harry Winston and not Kay? They're both diamonds, right? Totally get it. So he's like, there is a difference, and that is something that the consumer is going to understand. Now we would add two caveats to it. Data is valuable because data allows you to curate, sure. which is what Netflix has clearly. Yep. There's no question about it. And the other thing is global. It is going to be about who is global and understanding the preferences and the desires around the world is, as Tom Preston said to you. Now what worries us and where we think people are gonna have advantage, there's gonna be an advantage if you own those pipes. 
And that is something like, we worry about throttling. We sure. think about if that really does happen, who gets the advantages and the disadvantages? And so some have that advantage already. Sure. Um, and so that is something that is definitely in our thought process and the jury's out on how that's all gonna work out. Um, but the basic idea is content, this curation, data enables curation. And one other thing about that data, it enables ad buying and ad targeted ad, ad focus. So you can spend a lot more money if you've got someone on their phone shopping for a car and you see that and you can serve up that car ad, you can charge a lot for that car ad with that car company and that car ad that you sell is gonna enable you to buy a lot of content. So there's a lot of this that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the smartest people, most impressive people I know, Melody Hobson. Thank you. Thank you.